Lord of heaven, we need you, and we ask that you'd bless us, that we will be taken from this place and that our minds will be drawn up to you. You've said that in prayer, we don't bring you down to us, you bring us up to you. And we pray that you would help us to have our minds in connection with the blessings that you have offered through your word, through your people, through this gathering that we have together. May it be that your agency, the agency of your spirit, will be able to minister on our behalf, preparing our hearts to hear and understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches, and that we'll be able to enjoy a time without distractions or interruptions. We thank you so much for giving us this time, and as was mentioned, help us to have hearts that are ready to hear your word. And Lord, I don't want to speak, I want to hear your words even through my own voice. So please, take control, Lord, and bless us, we pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. amen. So as you can see, the message is entitled, Christ in You, How? This is important to me because it is a message that I love to understand better. I want Christ in me. What about you? I don't want Daniel in me. You see, the, the better you are, the better you are. That's really because the less of me, the more of Christ. And if my life could be like that 100% of the time, I would be happy. But you know, there's a problem. I'm still breathing, I'm still thinking, I'm still emotional, I'm still with all my stuff. Junk in the trunk, you know what I'm saying? And so what we have is our own lives that are trying to mingle together with the divine life and we're constantly trying to get us to get in the way. But if we get out of the way somehow, then Christ is going to be able to live and it will be that we can be in unification, we can be full of love and full of patience and always have joy and peace and the world's going to hate us. Ooh, it's going to hate us. To the point where they will kill you because they didn't know the Father or the Son, as it says in John 16, verse 3, right? So all of this is our wish, but it's really our death sentence too. So it's kind of like an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, I want to be like Christ, and that's going to kill me. <laughs> that doesn't sound right, but it is true. We know that that's what is going to cause the wrath of the enemy. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, how? Okay. I'm going to try to look at sections of the Bible. Some of them are just verses here and there, but sections of, I, I want to try to look at. The sections that try to illustrate this very important point. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause, there's a cause, and for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the Father is Jehovah. That's God, right? That's the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. Amen. And that God has a son of the Old Testament and a son in the New Testament. Amen. And so it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That would be by the Father, for your knowledge. The Father has a family, and all that family is named after him. In fact, it just called him the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? That he should grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Amen. Amen. I want to be strengthened by his spirit in my inner man. Now, this inner man idea doesn't actually come up a lot. So when you try to find it in the Bible, you don't find it too often. And so what I'm going to do is just look at this verse. And as it says in the notes there, see 1 Peter 3, 4. We're going to go to 1 Peter 3, 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. That's the inner man idea. It's the hidden man of the heart. It's the one that's that unseen power that is there that gives you all the stuff you need to be like Christ, but you can't really see it. You can't grab it, you can't feel it. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. 
Uh, I know that Brother Dooley mentioned a verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. I love that verse. That we are to be born again, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed. By the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Right? So it, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. So that's one of the verses that we're keying off of this thing. Oh, by the way, if you were interested in these notes, they are available. They're available right now. I just put them up the, uh, earlier today. If you were to go to Revelation with Daniel and you were to look up this link, Christ hyphen in hyphen you, you would then find this link, which has a previous presentation, which I will replace with this one. And all the notes right here that we're looking at, they're all available just by going there. So if you're interested, you can find it. Anyways. So for this cause, Paul actually bowed on his knees, praying to the Father of our Lord that he would grant to you, not himself, but he's included, according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Amen. Amen. Now, what does the word heart mean in the Bible? Mind. The mind. Okay, we already looked at that last time we were together, so I'm not going to do it again. But that Christ would dwell in your mind by faith. Now, we heard this already several times. Say it with me. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, faith cometh by hearing. Say it with me. Now, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that Christ would dwell in your minds as a result of where faith comes from, which is the word of God. Is that what that's saying or not? That's what that's saying. So Paul has bowed on his knees. He's praying to the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's saying to the Father, could you please give them the abundance of your riches that your Son, that Christ, would dwell in their minds by the Word of God from whence faith comes. I hope that sinks in real deep. That Christ may dwell in your minds by faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, what is love? Well, it's the first and foremost, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The greatest of these is love. In fact, I think that's the end of 12. But then 13 explains all about what love is. And then when you go to Galatians 5 verse 22 where it says that the fruit of the Spirit are these. What's the first one? Love. So, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in the Spirit, the foremost fruit of the Spirit, love, you may be able to actually comprehend with all saints, not just you, no interpretation of, no way, no, no prophecy of the Bible is of any private interpretation. There you go. So it's with all the saints that you may actually comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of and to know, not, not just comprehend, but to, that's like comprehending is of the mind, but to know is like a physical intimate thing, right? And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Okay, wait a minute, Paul. You're telling me I'm going to be able to comprehend and know something that passes knowledge? That's an oxymoron, Paul. What are you talking about? No, no, no. You'll be able to comprehend what is the breadth, length, depth, height, and know the love of Christ, which is actually beyond knowledge. That you, notice now, read it with me, that you might be, say it with me, filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Whoa. Is that actually what that said? Are you telling me that Paul is praying on his knees to the Father that we will be filled with all the fullness of God? I thought it pleased the Father that in his Son would all the fullness dwell. And now you're telling me that Paul is praying that in you 
all the fullness will dwell? Are you telling me that I have the same wording of the Bible as Jesus had for him when he was a human? That in me all the fullness of God can dwell? Is that what that's saying? Was that Paul's prayer? Was Paul praying something that cannot be accomplished? Paul was praying something that was a real, actual thing that he knew that we could understand and we could comprehend. We can know these things. That to me is beyond my understanding. That's why it says it passes knowledge, right? I don't know how that works. How am I going to be filled with all the fullness of God? Now, does that mean you should worship me, dear brother Bobby? Oh, absolutely not. The Bible gives no okay to worship any human ever. And you say, whoa, 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 people worship Jesus. Right, they worship the divine son of God that was within that human flesh. They didn't worship the human aspect of Jesus. I will not accept that they worshiped a human. They worshiped the divine son of God, which was clothed with humanity. And as a result of worshiping him, they were giving glory to the father. Amen. So we don't worship humanity. We worship the divine son of God that was clothed with humanity, yes. But it's not okay to worship humanity. And you can challenge me on that, but you might have to wrestle me down to the ground on that one. So now, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. How? That Christ may dwell in your minds by faith. Faith, say it with me, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That Christ may dwell in your hearts or minds by the word of God. That's what Paul is praying on his knees to the Father. That's huge. I'm not making it up because you read it with me. That's what it's saying. 1 John 4, verse 12. Now, no man hath seen God at any time. Well, if we love one another, which is the first and foremost of the fruit of the Spirit... It is the Spirit of God. If we love one another, because the Bible does say God is love, does it not? Does it say God is joy? I saw somebody in the back of the like, no. Does it say God is peace? Uh, you have the God of peace. Right, the God of peace. But God is peace? No. God is temperance. God is merciful. Well, maybe, because like, you see that with Paul, uh, Moses, right? Merciful long-suffering, gentleness. Uh, I don't remember all those right off the top of my head, but the foremost one, God is love. Oh, by the way, this is really interesting because there is in almost every church of the world something that is misunderstood, and I will die on this hill. God is love. Now, that doesn't mean that God has to be more than one because you can only have love with more than one. There is a single being in the universe that is God. That is the Father. Amen. The Father has a son. His name is today Jesus Christ. Before that, it was the Son of God. And there are other names. We won't talk about that because somebody might throw up their arms. But if... There is one God, and he is love. What kind of love is that? No, 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 there's, there's more than one kind. It's agape, right. Now, if you have love that demands more than one person, then that's not agape, that's eros. Chew on that one for a little bit. Yeah, takes two to tango, right? What does tango mean? Not just dancing, necessarily. And so what we have here is we have God who is love so that the fullness of God would dwell in you that Christ may be in your minds by faith. So if we love one another, God dwells in us. How? By his son. In fact, I'm going to look up that one real quick because I don't think I pulled that one up. It's going to be um, 1 John 5 verse 11. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Now, what kind of life is that? That's life that is original, unborrowed, and underived. In fact, he's given it to us. It says right there that God hath given to us eternal life. 
And where do we get that life? In his son. So the fullness of God being in our minds by faith would be the spirit of God through the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, right? So that's what that means over here in, whoops, I did it again. There, in this verse, if we love one another, God dwells in us. How? By his son, as we just said. But it's the spirit of his son, of course, because Christ in you is not physically Christ jumping out of heaven and filling my physical body with his physical body. Christ is in heaven. So is the Father. But by their spirit, they are able to dwell within us. Amen? So, if we love one another, if we have that first and foremost fruit of the spirit, which is love toward one another, God dwells within us. And his love is perfected in us. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is what? Perfect. The love of God can be perfected in you as it can be in me. How? As Paul was praying on his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ may dwell in your minds as a result of where faith comes from, which is the Word of God. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us. Wait, we dwell in him? How? We're going to learn about that in a minute. And he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Okay, so wait a minute. If his spirit is his mind, which we'll learn about later, you put two verses, Isaiah 40, verse 13, and Romans 11, verse 34 together, and you realize that Paul was using the word mind for the word spirit when he was quoting Isaiah, okay? And so when you have the spirit being the mind, if God is in us, and we are in God, and it's that Christ is actually bringing the spirit of the Father to us, and it's in our minds, then wouldn't it equal that if my mind is dwelling on the Father and the Son, if my mind is contemplating their being, their person, their actions, their words, their thoughts, their desires for me and for them, for the unity they want us to have, if they're doing the same thing to me, then my mind is in them and their mind is in me and we're, there's this connection that's the knowing that the Bible talks about. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his mind, his spirit. Now this is something interesting because John chapter 14 verse 10 says, Believest thou not that... I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Well, Jesus, how? What are you talking about? You're in the Father, and the Father is in you. Well, the very next words. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Oh, so the words of your Father are within you, Jesus. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, because he says, believe this. I'm in my Father, and my Father is in me. And they're like, huh? It will... The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. And they're like, oh, okay. But the Father that dwells in me, how? By faith. He dwells in his son's heart by faith. He's the one doing the works. So the Father actually can dwell in us. The Son of God is the one that brings the Father to us. He's the only mediator between God and men. He's the one that is that bridge that Jacob dreamed about all the way from the earth, all the way to heaven. The Father's standing up there speaking, and there are angels ascending and descending with that message that the Father is speaking to give to the prophet. That's the same thing that we see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. So 14.23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man has the same spirit my father has, if a man love me, he will keep my words just like I have the same spirit of my father and I keep his words. Well, then my father will love him because he keeps my words and there's this mutual love one toward another. I can love my son who is currently on his way to Thailand to be there as a missionary for three full months. I love him right now. And he loves me. And because I'm imagining him 
on a plane, maybe trying to sleep, maybe trying to eat, who knows what he's doing right now. I'm with him in spirit. I'm with him in mind. So it says, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we, because the son is the way that we get the father, will come unto him and make our abode with him. We're going to stay with him. How? We're going to stay in his mind. And here's how I know that. Um, I'm going to get to it in a bit. I forgot about this part. Now you are clean, Jesus said just after that, through the word. Or is it that he comes down and scrubs your spirit down personally with a some kind of brush. No, it's not like that. It's not mystical. It's actual. By the word of God, which came from his mind. My words, by the way, are coming from my mind. I'm giving you a piece of my mind. And you're able now to understand what's in my head. As you read God's word, you get to get into his head. And if you like what's in his head, you might just fall in love with him. I can't wait to see my father's face. I want to very much. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. Well, how, Jesus? Well, you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Well, yeah, Jesus, but how am I going to abide in you? You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Oh, okay. Can you say it again? You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So now, are you telling me that I'm dirty because of sin, right? Jesus is like, yes. Okay, so now, if your word takes over my mind, that word is going to clean my mind of all the stuff that Satan has put in there? Yes, that's it. And you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. My word is spirit. My word is life. He said earlier in chapter 6, verse 63. And that was actually, that verse, 63, is actually an interpretation of 53, where Jesus was saying, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life. But if you don't do that, you don't have life. And so Jesus was actually giving a further explanation of that by saying in verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. And that's how you live, with God's spirit and life. You have his word. Like, for example, first, uh, not first, but I think it's verse 11 of Psalm 119. It says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But I'm not looking for that one. I'm looking for this one. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How is it that a young man's going to be clean? By taking heed according to thy word. Oh, that's kind of the same thing Jesus was saying. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If you want pruning, if you want sanctification, if you want to retain justification, as we're told, I love that phrase, then you are a partaker of God's word which is his mind, which is spirit and life. You see? You put those things together and you've got a very solid package of continuing to retain justification, which we could call sanctification. Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, in other words, we don't have that relationship of our minds blending together. We don't have a knowledge of each other. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. He's withered. He doesn't have the life-giving source that God the Father has sent, which is the Son. And men gather them and cast them into the fire at the end of time, and they are burned in the fires of hell. Verse 7. If you abide in me, and just to say it again, if you didn't get it beforehand, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Galatians 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It is the Spirit that gives life. That word quickeneth actually means gives life. It's translated that way. 
It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh that I was talking about, eating my flesh and drinking my blood, that doesn't profit a single thing. In fact, that's why the Catholics have gone wrong in their transubstantiation. They believe truly that the priest will recreate their creator every single time they bless a piece of bread. And it is now the actual flesh and actual blood of Jesus Christ. And when you partake of those things, you are now with Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a very physical, awkward understanding of that passage in uh, John chapter 6. Because Jesus explained what he was saying, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. So what if I want the spirit and life of Christ in me? According to Jesus in that verse, where would I go? To his words. Absolutely. Absolutely. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. You are clean through thy word, which is truth. Cleanse them, sanctify them, purify them, prune them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. How? By the word. How is the church going to be purified? By the word. Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot because of the word, or wrinkle because of the word, or any such thing because of the word, but that it should be holy and without blemish because of the word. If there is any kind of reformation apart from the word, it is Satan's reformation. You can read it for yourself in a great book called The Great Controversy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. There it is, Brother Matt. Seeing you have purified your souls, how? In obeying the truth. Where does the truth come from? The Word of God, from Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who gets it from the Father. The Father gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to an angel. The angel brings it down to the prophet, and the prophet then gives it to you. Now, it's your responsibility to give it to somebody else. So you're actually part of that communication network of God's Spirit, from heaven to the earth. The word is spirit. The word is life. Now, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That love, again, there's that love, the, the, that fruit of God the Father. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by God's word, the word of God, which lives and abide forever. That to me is powerful. I love that verse. When I was a pastor in Michigan, this was one of my favorite verses. And then also the other one that was my favorite was John 6, 63. The spirit is the one that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak into you, they are spirit and life. Those two word, the verses for me were like some of my favorite. Now I feel like I understand them far better than I did because I was still not in a good understanding of who God is and what the Bible says about him. But now since then, I feel like these verses have really come alive. Romans 12, verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you suppose Christ would suggest we were purified by the renewing of our mind? Through his word, yes. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if your mind is renewed, you'll be able to prove what is God's will. You can test it, prove it, challenge it. Like, are you really saying this? Are you really saying that you love me even though I have done such evil things? Are you saying that if I read your word, you can actually make me whole? You can make me pure? I can be holy? God, are you for real that if I'm in need of clothes, food, or a place to lay my head, you will provide for me? Are you serious? Go ahead and prove it. If you have a renewing of the mind by the word of God, which it doesn't say it in this verse, but that's the idea that we've been reading about through Christ and through Peter and through Paul, you'll be able to prove his perfect will. Again, it's the spirit that gives life, the flesh, profits nothing, the words, our spirit, the words, are life. Romans 10, verse 4. This is a powerful section of the Bible here. 
Christ is the final completion, the fulfillment, the purpose even of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Amen? Now, there is an interesting verse I want to bring up real quick. It's John 14, verse 12. Verily I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. So if you believe, what are you going to do? Sit there? No, you're going to actually have a life that is transformed as a result of your faith. Okay? And so when it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes, that means those that believe will actually have the same exemplifying works that parallel their claimed faith. You see? We can't just say, you know, I, I believe Christ is my righteousness and then go off and beat your wife and drink and molest your child, which I have had in my uh, family, like relations, uncle kind of thing, and it was ugly, very ugly. My cousin was insane and as a result of that, for 12 years from her father, my uncle, she jumped in front of her train and dismembered herself over the next 100 or 200 yards. So Christ is the completion of the law for righteousness to everyone who practices what they believe, not just saying. Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law that the man which does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is by faith speaks on this wise. Do not say, say not in your heart, which is in your mind. Who's going to go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from heaven? No, it, it actually says, don't say that you're going to bring Christ down from heaven with this righteousness which is by faith. Okay? So the righteousness which is by faith does not say we're going to go up and bring Christ down from heaven. Or who's going to ascend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up again from the dead. No, you're not going to say either of those. But what does it say? What saith it? Okay, what does what say? What does righteousness which is of faith say? How does it speak? What is it talking about? It says, the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. What is your heart? Your mind. Where, do your, where does the mouth get the words that it's supposed to speak? From your mind. Okay. So don't bring Christ down from heaven. Don't bring him up from the tomb again. But rather, the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. Well, this is the same chapter that says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's in verse 17. It's the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe, remember believing is, is paralleled with works, in your mind, in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe what's true and your life is in parallel with that which is true, because of God's grace, this has nothing to do with you. We know that. We, we are, I'm positive, every one of you understands, you're not righteous. Yeah. Now, do we understand that like what you were saying? Probably not. You know, you were getting down to the core like we all think we understand the Laodicean message, but we don't really understand the Laodicean message. We can quote it, we can talk about it. In fact, I could sing it for you because there's a song way back in the day that I learned about the Laodicean message, but... I don't know that I understand it that well, that fully. But what it can say for sure is that we are not righteous in, of, in and of ourselves to be able to claim a right in through the gates of the holy city. Is that fair? Everybody understands that. So the word of faith which we preach that if a man shall confess with his mouth and believe with his mind or heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, with the mind, man believes unto right doing, as was mentioned before. And with mouth, or with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, with the mouth, confession, what does that come from? With your mouth confessing something, it comes from your mind, right? With the mouth, your mind actually works and it makes confession of Christ 
and that's who you believe in, that's why you believe. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Remember later in this chapter it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But just so that we know, in this section it's very clear, righteousness which is of faith does not bring Christ down from heaven, does not bring Christ up from the grave. But it does say, the word is in your mouth. Now, this is the part that I was talking about. This is really, really interesting to me. This is the leadership or the elder unto the elect lady, which is the church and her children, the converts, whom I love in the truth. Now, the truth here is, I think, and I think you probably will agree as we continue on in this section, it's not talking about Jesus as the word. He is the word, as we know. But this is talking about real factual, logical, God-sent truth, facts. So I love you in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Now, some of these people alive during the time John wrote those things weren't able to meet Jesus face to face. They didn't know the truth, but they know the truth that he has given. They want to be in concert with the spirit of truth, right? So I love you in the truth and all those that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which does what? Dwells in us and shall be with us, how long? Forever. You mean to tell me that truth is living in me? Yes, the spirit of truth. The comforter, by his word, is living in our minds by faith. That Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith is what Paul was praying for on his knees. For the truth's sake which dwells in us and shall be with us forever. Remember Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of the world. Remember that? How, Jesus? Well, Paul said it very well in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your minds by faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now, for the truth's sake, truth will dwell in us and will be with us forever. You know what that means? That means that as long as I have a cognitive, intelligent mind, you cannot take truth from me. You can beat my body down. You could slay me. You could strip me and put me up in the sun, on the Sahara Desert, without water for weeks at a time. I'd be dead by then. But you could do any kind of thing you want to do, but you cannot take the truth from me. The truth will dwell in me and be with me forever as long as I live. Now, if I choose to change my mind, that's my business. And I'm at fault for that. Giving in, caving because of the persecution that comes. A lot of people have done that. You can go through and read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And there's all kinds of that stuff in history. But you can't take truth from me. That truth is dwelling in me and will be with me forever. And you can say the same thing. For the truth's sake, I love those that are in the truth, and I love you because you love the truth. Now notice right here it says, this is why it's not talking about the Son as the word or the truth. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. And so this truth is from his word. That's where we get truth. In fact, that's why you need the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth. All that stuff comes from the word of God. And then it says praying always. So that's your response to the word as you're speaking back to God. That's the praying always. He's speaking to you. That's where you get the helmet of salvation. Salvation is found in the word. The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is found in the word. The belt of truth. Truth is found in the word. The shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, which is found in the word. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of truth. The shield of buckler, or the the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing, which is by the word. So everything you get in the uh, Ephesians chapter 6 armory is in the word. And then all your response to that word is speaking back, praying. God is talking to you. That's how you get all your strength. And you speak back, praying always. You have this communication together. And pretty soon you're going to be in love with this one you find who is God. And you'll love his son who demonstrated him 
in the flesh for 33 years, 2,000 years ago. God was in Christ? Yep. To wit that God was in Christ. Remember, John chapter 14, verse 10, he said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? And they're like, huh? The words that I speak into you, they're not my words. They're the words of the Father. Oh, okay, so the words. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So God sent his Son, and now the Son is sending us with that same reconciliation ministry. That's why the Bible says so plainly, let this mind be in you. It doesn't say which was Christ's. It says which was also in Christ Jesus. So the mind which was also in Christ Jesus was the mind of the Father. Let this mind be in you. The mind is the spirit. The spirit is the mind. They, they work together. I've got a whole lot of study on that. We're not looking at that today, but that is true, at least in part, because not every time you read the word spirit in the Bible does it mean the mind. Like, for example, the second time the word ruach is used in the Bible, which is spirit in the Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, where it calls it the cool of the day. Adam and Eve were walking in the cool of the day, in the ruach. And that's what I think Christ was referring to when he was saying, if the spirit is blowing, you don't know where it's coming from, but you see that it's moving the trees, right? Well, they saw that the trees were moving. That was the spirit of God. That was the movement. And it was Christ there in the garden with them. So where was God? Now, I'm going to go through this very quickly because this, is a, this could be a very long study. But well, I'm just going to show you there's 16 verses here that we're going to go through very quickly. My Father which is in heaven, Jesus said. My Father which is in heaven, Jesus said. My Father which is in heaven, Jesus said. My Father which is in heaven, my Father which is in heaven. Father which is in heaven, Father which is in heaven. Father which is in heaven, Father which is in heaven. O Father, Lord of heaven, which we know is in heaven. Father which is in heaven. And then later in 16, Father which is in heaven. 18, Father which is in heaven. There's uh, chapter 18, Father which is in heaven. Father which is in heaven. Father which is in heaven. So, Jesus, where's your father? That's only in Matthew. Thank you, he's in heaven, yes. That's only in Matthew. Okay, now, Matthew really had that burden that God the Father was in heaven, and he heard Jesus say it. He heard Jesus say it lots of times, and that's why he wrote it so many times. John didn't really pick it up. Mark didn't pick it up. Matthew didn't pick it up. I mean, sorry, Luke. But Matthew really picked that up. And that was one of the things he gave to his gospel was the fact that the Father is in heaven. And where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He actually ascended to the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, and now he's a priest before the Father. He's the only mediator between God and men, and we have those angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth, bringing our prayers, etc., to the only mediator between God and men. So, which is one way to understand the Spirit? I was speaking about this earlier, Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? It's quoted by Paul in Romans 11:34. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? There's the counselor of teaching him, who has been his counselor to teach him. And that's really what's happening there is even Paul understood the word spirit of the Lord could be referred to as the mind of the Lord. So it's not just a human thing, it's a divine thing as well. And here is something if you're interested, if you want to know about the mind and the spirit connection using the Bible alone, then please look at Revelation with Daniel, the spirit and mind in the Bible. You could just type in the search spirit and mind and it'll come up. How do we hear Christ knocking? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I will come into him. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the, say with me, the word of God. Does Christ still physically cast out of the temple? So he found in the temple those that sold oxen, and it says in verse 15, when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple, and he poured out all the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said to them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And from a book written many years ago that is very powerful, no man can of himself cast out the evil throng that have taken possessions of his heart. 
Only Christ can cleanse the soul temple. But he will not force an entrance. But he comes not into the heart as to the temple of old. He comes not into the heart, today that is, as to the temple of old. But he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And we read those already. His presence will cleanse and sanctify the soul. May Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. His presence, his spirit is his presence. Like I said earlier, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. That's my mind. Now, listen, if I were to say to you, what's in my mind right now? You'd be like, come on, man. That's what women try to do to men, right? Okay, I don't want to get in trouble. I better not go too far on that one. <laughs> well, the men, so we got a different scenario here. And the husband's going, come on now, I don't understand. But what's happening is, you don't know what's in my mind. But if I told you what's in my mind, then you would know an actual piece of me, a part of me. It's my mind. You don't know what's in my mind. I'm thinking, dear brother DeMario, of an orange umbrella, not a red one. You see? But you didn't know that until I gave you a piece of my mind. Now you know that part of me that I had hidden from you. And I don't know how many of you are curious or not, like, what is he thinking about? It was an orange umbrella. Right? But that's the thing is his, you, I gave you a part of me. Nobody else knew that as a human on the earth. That was mine. And I gave it to you. And so his presence, a part of him, his mind, will cleanse and sanctify the soul. Where does his mind come from? The words are spirit and life. The word spirit is, is synonymous with mind. The words come from the mind. His presence, which I believe is his spirit, 100%, I believe Christ can actually be with me by his presence, which I believe is his mind will cleanse and sanctify the soul so that it may be a holy temple unto the Lord and an habitation of God through the Spirit. What is the Spirit? But the mind, which you're supposed to have by faith. Now, there are just a couple of references here to some books that were written many years ago. Consider the prayer of Christ. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. Did Christ make a mistake in his prayer? The angels are waiting. How long shall they be grieved and disappointed because you do not see how sad it is to live in transgression of the law of God? After you've been the subject of so much solicitude and work on the part of the heavenly agencies to sway back the powers of darkness, after the light is shown into the chamber, chambers of the mind and into the soul temple, Will you turn from that light and close your eyes lest you shall see and your ears lest you shall hear the heavenly invitation? All the universe of heaven is waiting. Will you obey or will you dally and grieve the Spirit of God by your continual disobedience? Written in 1900. Those who do the words of Christ will perfect a Christian character because Christ's will is their will. Thus is Christ formed within the hope of glory. Christ's will is their will. Thus, this is how Christ is formed within the hope of glory. Oh, that, that's a pamphlet, by the way. When his words of instruction have been received and taken possession of us, Jesus is to us an abiding presence. Okay, when his words have been received and taken possession. So now I've got a choice between what's right and what's wrong. I'm actually going to put what's wrong over here because it's the left side and what's right is over here on my right hand, okay? So what's wrong or what's right? I have a choice. And I could really want what's wrong. I could be like, man, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to... And God's spirit through the ministration of his agents, are like, ah, 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 ah. I'm like, what, what, what's going on? You ought to follow the Lord because the Bible says that it's better to go that direction and thou shalt not. I'm like, you know what? That's true. I'm going to choose that. When his words 
have been received and have taken possession, Jesus is to us an abiding presence, controlling the thoughts and ideas and actions. That's what I want. I want his words, those living words. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, what does it say? The word of God is quick and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith means, now here's the definition, Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith means the contemplation of Christ, beholding Christ, ever cherishing the dear Savior as our very best and honored friend, so that we would not in any action grieve and offend him. That's what it means. There's another one where it says it means. Christ dwelling in our hearts means bringing the character of God into our lives. How? That Christ would dwell in your minds by faith, which comes by hearing the word of God, and that you would have the ability to understand and know the fullness of his love, and that you will be full, or have the fullness of his, how does it go now? Ephesians chapter 3. That all the fullness of God will dwell in you, right? So that's amazing. And it means, Christ dwelling in our hearts, means bringing the character of God into our lives. Keeping the commandments of God is manifesting the character of Jesus Christ. It does not mean bringing Christ down from heaven or Christ up from the grave. That's what Romans chapter 10 said. In giving us his spirit, God gives of himself, his mind. If he gives us his mind, that's his He's the originator of everything. The word of God is his. It's his actual mind on paper. And somehow it's a living word. I don't know. I don't understand that part. But it changed my life. I'll tell you that. When I started reading the word of God, I have been transformed. I was a heavy metal drummer in a band. It was called, after I left, it was called Forced Fed Aggression. It was much like it was. I mean, we'd get up behind the I'd get it behind the drums and just, you know, just like all that stuff. And I just felt so powerful being able to keep the beat and just like rock people in the audience, you know. And I would drink and do drugs and all that stuff. I started reading the Bible and my life changed. One week later, I was a very different person. Radically changed. If we repent of our transgression and receive Christ as a life giver, our personal savior, we become one with him. And our will is brought into harmony with his divine will. I like that. And I want it. And so I am trusting that God has given us something to contemplate. You don't have to believe what I taught. But I am praying that it will at least give some further evidence that there is something here that may not have been considered. And if that's true, praise God. Now, I don't understand all this, but I'm understanding it better, and I want to understand it better. Do you want to understand this better? Sure. Is that a desire of yours? Yeah. Do you want that experience that Paul was on his knees praying for, that Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith, and you would be full with all the fullness of God, that you can comprehend and know what is the love of God that passes understanding? Is that what you want? Yeah. Me too then let's pray for that. Let's pray right now that God will help us to get to that end so that we will be ready for translation. Amen. Perhaps one of the 144,000. Amen? Let's pray. <laughs> Our Father which art in heaven, Thank you for giving us this message. I pray that we would be transformed into the likeness of your dear son. That your character that he demonstrated would actually be part of our lives. That we would become one with you, one with your son, and one with each other. That there would be the ability to understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches. What your mind is saying to the churches. 
I ask that you would please help us to comprehend and to know what is the breadth and depth and height and length of your love that Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith and that we will have the abilities to actually experience having all the fullness of God within us as it says in Ephesians 3.